an easy example. I've done a ton of business in Lehigh Acres, Florida, and slightly larger lots on the corner sell very quickly or duplex lots. If you can find lots zone for duplex, that, that is the fastest moving type of land I have ever seen in my life. I think we've done eight of them this year and they've all sold within a day or two on Facebook or Craigslist. I haven't even had to list them. And so What's up, everybody? My name is Mason McDonald here with Dan Habercos for the Big Picture Blueprint. And today, on July 12th, 2023, Dan and I are going to be kind of just talking about the state of the market that we are experiencing within each of our businesses and each of the individual markets that we're in. Dan, how are you doing today? Mason, I'm great. I'm excited to talk a little bit about what's going on this summer. Yeah, yeah. No, the the thing is, you know, the market uh, this summer compared to last summer is very different mm -hmm. uh, and compared to two summers ago is in a whole different universe. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, um, we're still getting deals. Uh, we're still making money and uh, there's still a lot of opportunity um, in land, in commercial and residential and all of the various asset classes that we're in. Um, so. No matter what the news is telling you, uh, you can make things happen if you're creative and you're strategic in the way that you both purchase and maintain and hold your assets. So, uh, Dan, let, let's kind of, you know, maybe jump right into where our markets are. So where are you currently uh, investing? Where are you currently flipping and where, you know, what what's exciting to you right now? Where are you at? Yeah, so big picture. Um... The Southeast, Florida, North Carolina, doing a lot of deals of just buying and selling land. New Mexico down in some of the metros around Albuquerque, same thing. And then Colorado is where I have all my buy and holds and all my new builds. Uh, so I keep everything that's a little more complex here local. Well, and those are all great markets to be in. Um, you know, Florida has been hot forever. North Carolina has been hot for uh, quite a long time right now. And Colorado in terms of buy and hold, man, everyone wants to live in Colorado. So yeah. And to, 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 I mean, to expand on that, to answer the initial question, uh, Florida and North Carolina are still very busy, especially where I'm at in North Carolina. Uh, I'm kind of all over Florida South. If you drew a, a line from Jacksonville over to the West coast, I am in like a dozen markets South of that. And it's summer. And summer in Florida is like winter in Colorado, where it's the slow time, the population dwindles, and there's far less transaction volume. Uh, so it's the slow time of year. Nonetheless, I mean, I have three lots in Florida going under contract to sell today. Uh, so they're still Good moving. For you. Um, yeah, I mean, they're, they're still selling. They're not selling quite as high as I wanted. Two of them are owner finance, albeit at a really high interest rate. But um, Florida is still overall very hot. We're just in the slower time of the year. North Carolina still very, very in demand. Uh, New Mexico is a slower state. It's more that I have an employee that is licensed there and uh, grew up there, so he knows it street by street. So we have a deal closing there today, actually, uh, to sell. And then um, Colorado, I, I'll wait until we get a little further along and start talking new builds. But Colorado is an interesting one because I'm seeing kind of opposing dynamics depending on the market, the asset type. Uh, and so on. But I'll, I'll pause there and let you talk a bit about your markets. Yeah. So um, for, for my buy and hold, I only own one. I own one commercial building here in Colorado uh, that we're converting into workforce housing, uh, which is a fun, exciting uh, project uh, that'll cash flow like crazy and help the community as well. Um, and then for my land business, I'm in Colorado and Arizona. So for Colorado, um, you know, the, the market's definitely moving a lot slower than what I've historically been accustomed to, um, you know, and I've only been in the business for a couple of years now, uh, and I got in at the right time. But, um, you know, in you, you can look at the data, and it's so easy to pull up, you know, the last 14 days, um, you know, on Zillow or something like that, and kind of see where land's selling. And it's all kind of the small rural, you know, lots in the mountain towns. I mean, there's you know, in the more developed areas in Colorado, like in Colorado Springs, there's almost a zero land transactions that happen at all. And, you know, it's because it's kind of full, fully built out and even moving east, there's less transactions happening. Mm -hmm. So Colorado's slowed down a lot. Uh, you know, it's it, it's hard to say why, but we can get into some of the speculations and also some of the data later. Uh, for Arizona, Arizona is hotter than Colorado for sure. Um, you know, if you look at last 14 days sale, it's about double what Colorado has. 
Um, but, you know, comparing Arizona to Florida, uh, you know, Arizona's got about 526 on market land sales in the past 14 days uh, compared to Florida, which has about 1800. So uh, you're definitely in the right market there. But, um, you know, Arizona, there was a little bit of, you know, wishy washy with uh, water and, you know, some water issues that were going on where there was some moratorium on building, you know, going mm -hmm. on for a little bit in the Phoenix area. But there's always going to be opportunity where there's a desirability for where people want to live and people want to live in Colorado, people want to live in Arizona, you know, so it's just you got to spend some time in the market and make sure you buy low. Uh, but yeah, I, I think with, um, you know, the these two markets, it makes me uh, jealous and makes me want to copy you, Dan, and get into some of these really, really hot markets in Florida and North Carolina. Um, but uh, just like you said, Colorado is is different. What I'm what I'm not used to being in Colorado is the idea of seasons existing. You know, mm -hmm. being from Texas, where there are no seasons, and summer has finally started here. Yeah, uh, summer doesn't really start until July here in Colorado, uh, which is uh, you know exciting. Where a lot of the properties that have been on the market for the past few months, where we've you know listed them with pictures of snow on it, uh, we've gone out reshot. You know with, you know, big, you know, beautiful wildflowers and green grass, and they're getting a lot more interest now. So there is a little bit of that emotionality associated with business out here, at least in the summer. Sure, sure. Yeah. And especially the product that you're selling, a lot of what I'm selling is a simple commodity in that it's, you know, one of many thousands of identical lots that builders are buying to build on. And so that's very different than, you know, like the deal we did together in Larkspur. It's a beautiful lot that someone's going to fall in love with, right? That's a totally different product, totally different end user. Uh, totally different motivation for purchase. Exactly, exactly. And I think that's a great example of a lot of the types of lots that you're going to be able to get in Colorado that you can really purchase at a substantial discount, where if you think about Colorado as a whole, you've got a handful of bigger markets. You've got Colorado Springs, you've got Pueblo and Pueblo West, you have Denver and the surrounding areas, Fort Collins and Boulder. Um, and then it's a bunch of small sub markets uh, that are still larger, you know, Durango and kind of along the Western slope. And, you know, where we are with the deal that we've partnered on in Larkspur, it's right in between Colorado Springs and Denver. Um, it's a more rural community, uh, but it's beautiful, you know, yeah. million dollar homes, beautiful homes. It's a very sloped lot, which, you know, you can build on and, you know, people that aren't from Colorado would be blown away that you can build on the type of stuff out here. But, uh, you know, who the end buyer is on a lot like that is typically, it's going to be a retiree, yep. you know, or a second kind of vacation home. So whenever you think about that, there's a much smaller buyer pool versus some of the areas in Florida that you're in where, you know, the, the end buyer uh, would build, you know, a three, two starter home mm -hmm. or something like that. Right. Yeah. And to that point, uh, I think the simple uh, kind of bifurcation here is the middle class, uh, very commoditized sort of product is still moving. Like those three lots that I, I said are going under contract today, they're in the, uh, let's see, 26.5 for two of them. Each of them are selling at 26.5 in Palm Bay. And then one's at 29 in Vero Beach Estates. And so they're very entry level. They're people who just need a house, right? These aren't frivolous purchases. And that's what's still moving. And that's true with spec homes as well, which we'll get into in, in a minute. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, it's the entry level stuff that a good, a much larger portion of the country can afford that I'm still seeing move both with the land and, and houses. You're absolutely right. Where it's, you know, when you're looking at the rural, you're looking at the, you know, potentially second home lots or the vacation lots or the retirement lots or the off grid lots. Um, those ones are moving slower right now compared to what they were like in the pandemic where, you know, mm -hmm. people in the pandemic, I mean, think about it from, you know, more of a social perspective of people wanted to leave the cities, they wanted to get the hell out of the cities. So you could put a rural off grid, you know, no horizontal development, the only thing you could do is put, you know, a tiny home with solar or a composting toilet and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, cistern for water and that that would sell like that in the pandemic. And yeah. right now, um, they're just moving slower, you know, people are, you know, strapped for cash more. They're less interested in doing this. You know, society has come back to normal in 2023 for the most part. Um, so they just don't move as quickly. And, uh, you know, with end owner financing costing a lot more money, um, you know, there's less speculative buyers out there to buy, you know, something like, uh, you know, some of the products that we offer. So 
Um, you're exactly right. Opening up the buyer pool to everyone, you know, from builders to entry level people um, is great. But the the confusing thing for me is, you know, from a strategic standpoint, you know, focusing on this lot that you and I did together where we purchased it, uh, you know, just under 40,000. Um, we put it on the market at 120 grand kind of towards the beginning of the year, you know, I think in February. Um, and then we we just did a price reduction from 120,000 to 109,500. And it's getting a lot of views, a lot of interest, mm -hmm. but moving that price, you know, say, say we moved it down to 60,000, uh, it wouldn't exactly help us. Um, you know, we might be able to move it a little bit quicker doing that, but the thing is a buyer would find that lot and find that price because that's what it's worth. So it's a different strategy from that standpoint, mm -hmm. but, uh, so to yeah, summarize right. there, it's because we're, we're looking for kind of the, the unicorn buyer and mm -hmm. that person isn't super concerned with price. They more just have to fall in love with that neighborhood and the idea of putting their home there. Exactly. Exactly. You know, it's the, the difference of, you know, someone coming and looking at a house that has, you know, Formica countertops, exact same layout, everything about it. Um, but they find the one with the granite countertops that's, $50,000 more, even though it was only $10,000 worth of granite and they'd rather purchase the granite one. So yeah. um, there's a little bit more emotion associated with these properties, but that's what gives you the greater return, uh, you know, from a cash on cash perspective, but the longer sales cycle. Yep. Yep. Cool. Okay. Well, let's, let's maybe niche down a bit into the specific asset type. We talked more about high level, uh, the, the market, uh, the big picture, and we talked a little bit about entry level versus more frivolous purchases, but a point I wanted to make here is within any given market, there's some I'm in that have really slowed down, but specific product within those sub markets are, are, are still selling or specific areas. And so an easy example, I've done a ton of business in Lehigh Acres, Florida, and very commoditized with the just thousands and thousands of identical infill lots that are all the same in, in every way, shape and shape or form. Uh, however, Slightly larger lots on the corner sell very quickly or duplex lots. If you can find lots zone for duplex, that, that is the fastest moving type of land I have ever seen in my life. I think we've done eight of them this year and they've all sold within a day or two on Facebook or Craigslist. I haven't even had to list them. And so knowing this about your market, what is really in demand is really essential. And so I just pulled a list for one of my guys at cold call in Palm Bay. Palm Bay has really slowed down, except the lots that have both water and sewer. So those are just examples. Uh, I don't know if you have any input there, Mason. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you know, I, I want to get into the technical aspect of it from a marketing strategy standpoint, um, you know, for all the people out there that are in the land flipping space where, you know, in go into a neighborhood with a lake or go into a neighborhood that has beautiful views in certain parts of it and doesn't have beautiful views in other parts of it where you could have a lakefront lot you know, I, you know, I help a lot of people that are, you know, doing businesses in, you know, kind of the Midwest into, you know, Michigan and kind of Tennessee and the South and there, and there's a lot of lakes out there. And we'll look at properties that are, you know, selling and on the market that are lakefront that are 200 to $600,000 for a quarter acre lot. And one street over that's not lakefront, the properties are selling for $15,000. Yeah. And so it's once again, it's supply and demand of the lakefront lots in so many of these neighborhoods that have these amenities in it are so desirable. And they've been built out to where, you know, there's one lakefront lot left in the neighborhood type of thing uh, is versus there's dozens and dozens or hundreds of lots right down the street. So, you know, and same thing in Colorado where, you know, the lot in Larkspur, for instance, it already has a rough thin building pad and driveway that makes it way more attractive than the other lots, you know, because it'll save money. But you know, there's areas where you can go in Colorado where you have gorgeous, stunning views of the front range, and then you could have uh, really just terrible views of uh, the Eastern Plains, you know, where you can see Kansas from your lot and people don't want that quite as much. So um, I think it's one of those things where, you know, comparing these types of markets where, you know, we can call them maybe, you know, vacation versus primary residence markets yeah. um, in the vacation markets. Think of the amenities, think of the emotion associated with it as versus a duplex lot in Lehigh Acres that an investor is going to come in, build a duplex for super cheap down there and be able to rent it out of, 
you know, as versus out here, it's going to be the custom home builder that does this and they're, you know, seeking the views and all the emotion tied to it rather than the product itself. Um, so I, I think that's kind of one way to, to look at it and compare it. My last point on it is, you know, for the people that send blind offers out there, you know, this is part of the problem with, you know, sending blind offers in very, very small areas of, you know, that corner duplex lot versus the, you know, R1 single family lot right down the street are going to be priced entirely different, just like the lakefront lot versus the other one. So just be thinking about your marketing material and how you can kind of align that with what the end or what the potential seller knows they have, because they know they have a good lot whenever they have one of those. Yeah. And, and all of this, you know, we're talking about our businesses as a whole. And so just to pivot to this whole conversation, but uh, applying it to rentals is true there as well. So I, I've had a number of units turn over in the last couple of months and uh, here in Colorado Springs, Denver, the whole front range, there are an obscene amount of large apartment complexes being built. And uh, I know some people in that space who are, are struggling, at least compared to what we've seen these last few years, right? So if you have a bunch of, you know, two ones, one one studio apartments, uh, whereas I had a, a house, one of my houses, that's a five three that came up for rent. And it's, it's, it's probably of all my home, uh, properties in the worst area of all of them, but the demand was crazy because there's such a lack of five bed, three bath homes or units of any kind for rent and families need that. And so this is applicable with rentals as well. You know, even within a market where certain assets might be struggling or, or going down a bit or rents might be being pushed down, there are others that are still thriving. And so you, you really have to dive deep dive into whatever market you're in for whatever asset you're doing business with and figure these things out. So you, you know what you're doing. Absolutely. And I mean, you're, you're exactly right. I five bed, three bath rentals at an affordable mm -hmm. price in Colorado yeah. Springs, they just don't exist. Yeah. And you know, you have to think about, you know, the specific demographic where in Colorado Springs, you know, there's a lot of military, there's a lot of young families, there's a lot of young couples. And, you know, i I've got two dogs right here in my office right now, where if I was a renter, you know, I, I need a yard. Yeah. So, you know, and I, I don't know, you know, how much, how many people you have that have pets, but you know, you have to think about the demographic of the area and kind of, mm -hmm. you know, attempt to choose the asset class. That's going to always be in very high demand for a buy and hold product where for the commercial building that we're converting into workforce housing, we're doing it in a ski town. Yeah. Um, you know, and the thing is, I mean, you hear it, you know, if you're familiar with Colorado or you know, more nationwide news is associated with Jackson Hole and their attempt to build affordable workforce housing because, you know, the ski resorts, the hot springs, the, you know, the county fairs and all that stuff, they don't, the, the employees there, unfortunately, just don't make a lot of money and they need affordable housing. And, you know, if you're in a vacation destination where there would be someone that wants it as a second home or an Airbnb or something like that, you're not, it doesn't make sense for you to get the three bed, two bath or the five bed, three bath that you're going to pay $1.2 million for um, and attempt to rent it out long term to someone out there because the people that are working out there, you know, it, they, they have a little bit more money um, from like the W2 job standpoint rather than the, or I guess it's W2 still, I digress from that. But, um, you know, just think about, you know, what is going to be, what product is going to be the most in demand mm -hmm. based on the market you're in. And that's not consistent across every market. Whenever there's a population of 3000 full-time residents versus 300,000 or a million full-time re residents. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, one more point I want to make on that is along this whole topic, don't, don't assume what you like in your perspective is that of everyone else, <laughs> because one of the markets I'm in in North Carolina, the demand for mobile home lots is outrageous. And a lot of these areas, they're rough. I would not want to be there. But guess, nonetheless, the, de the demand for mobile homes is crazy. And the lots that allow them. And so they still sell. They sell quickly. And maybe I don't want to live there, uh, but plenty of other people do. And there's lots of markets I've been in where this is applicable. So just a thought where you know, go into it uh, with an open mind as far as when you're exploring new markets, you know, what's the desirable product may not be something that's desirable to you. You're, you're so on, you know, the, the best career advice I ever got was, it's not about you. Yeah. And that can extend to so many things where, 
um, you know, whenever you bring your own opinion into it, um, you know, it can be helpful. Uh, you can be, you can go to a property and be like, okay, I can really see why this is desirable. Like that lot in Larkspur, once yeah. again, of uh, you go to it, you know, it's not for me exactly. Cause you know, the land is not super usable. You know, I like big open spaces, you know, for dogs to play or kids to play or anything like that. Um, but God bless the views would be insane, you know, drinking coffee on that patio and you mm -hmm. can picture yourself doing it. And you're like, I can see how tons of people would love this property. But one of my, I don't know, maybe it was my eighth or 10th land deal that I did was, you know, it was once again in Pagosa Springs, Colorado. And I, I can't remember what I paid for it, but we put it on the market for about 18 grand. And I thought it was going to sit forever. It was in a ravine with about none of it useful as you're going to the property. Like it, it felt like I was in deliverance <laughs> and it was the creepiest. I mean, people had like weird, like bones and stuff like on their properties and coming up and like weird, you know, you know, Confederate flags and all sorts of wild stuff going to this property. That property was on the market for about 12 minutes yeah. before it was off the market. And it was a different time, you know, it was, it, it was spring of last year, 2022. But I thought, I was like, why did I buy this thing? Like, this is the creepiest lot that I could never imagine any human being would ever want, especially someone that would buy it on the market listed with a broker. And what do you know? And so it's always that right there of like, don't think that you, what you like is what everyone else likes, um, yeah. you know, especially with those more niche markets, you know, or maybe even not niche markets. It might be considered a niche market to you, but to everyone else, it's like, Dude, that's our bread and butter. You know, True. these manufacture home lots in North Carolina or where, whatever county in North Carolina you're talking about. That's what people want. You know, yeah. that's what people want. They they don't want the HOA. They don't want, you know, people, you know, breathing down their necks about, you know, putting, you know, crazy shit in the yard and yeah. flamingos everywhere. Um, yep. But there's a lot of people. There's over 300 million people in this country. So don't think you know them all. Yeah, great point. Well, cool. Let's let's pivot into new builds and what I'm seeing there. And and so on, on my end, this will be specifically Colorado. And I have seen such a dramatic shift in the last couple of months. I, I got to talk about this. So in the last month, I have sold two spec homes, one in Pueblo West, Colorado, one in Colorado City, Colorado, which is a little bit further south from Pueblo West, still within Pueblo County. And I sold the one in Pueblo West at three hundred and fifty seven thousand. Now, last year I sold an identical home, 398. So it came down a bit, but here's what's crazy. In these last few months, inventory has really gotten eaten up here and especially in certain niches. And so just for anyone who's out of state who has no point of reference as far as price, it's a 322, 1500 square foot ranch, new construction. So very entry level as far as new construction goes. Now I looked at the market last week. There was nothing under, there was one at 39999. Other than that, there was nothing under 400 as far as stick built new construction because they're all gone. When I was selling mine, there was a bunch for sale at like 360, 367, 370. Uh, they're all gone. Hmm. And so, what, it, what, yeah. didn't, do you know what uh, like the older construction homes are going for? Uh, the not new builds that are 322 and 300 you know, square feet, give or take. I hadn't. Um, I haven't followed those quite as closely. But I know my realtor had sent just when we were working on selling that one and she was monitoring the market, we we're unsure what was going to happen. She sent me one that sold at like 340 and that was mm. slightly bigger for existing inventory. Um, so, again, and, and just as a lesson to the audience, part of what made me get rid of that one is I had a lot of cash into it. I had over 100 grand into that one. And um, uh, my construction loan was coming due. And this is hard because construction loans are always going to be shorter term, you know, nine to 12 months. Usually uh, I kind of wish I had a couple more months on that and could have just waited and left it at, you know, call it 380 or, you know, 390, whatever, and gotten it sold higher. But anyways, point being inventory, at least on the entry level side of things is getting eaten up quickly. It's still very restrained here in Colorado specifically along the front range. And uh, this is pretty consistent with what I'm hearing you know, friends of mine doing business in Denver and other places here in the state. And so I, I'm ramping up by building quite a bit more. Well, and I, I think, you know, sometimes people forget that that's a really, really great strategy, whether for it's a, 
you know, whether you're building to flip or building, you know, build to rent, it can be a lot cheaper to do it than going in and renovating a home um, or going and just buying a turnkey asset versus, you know, where if you're looking at your cost basis to build one of these homes, it it's a lot less, you mm-hmm. know, for you to do it yourself. And if you can find the land and match the land, you know, to the, the general contractor to build the house, you're getting instant equity where it's the idea of, you know, you hear about it so often of the forced appreciation through sweat equity and all that kind of stuff. And dude, you can do that and build it yourself for way cheaper and way better. And, um, you know, as someone that hasn't done a new build before, uh, you know, I know you had some headaches associated with, with some of it, mm-hmm. but man, going through a renovation or a rehab on an old property, it makes me never want to ever do it again because, yeah. you know, I look at you and it's like, Hey, here are the plans building it from the ground up. Uh, there's not going to be a ton of surprises that you run into, but, you know, from the actual, you know, construction standpoint, you know, there's going to be issues with the city and the you know county and the town and all the administrative clerical issues. And, you know, you still have to manage the contractors and everything like that, but it's not like you open up the wall and it's like, Oh dude, the studs are rotted to the core. Yeah. Um, you know, you're, <laughs> it's the idea of, Hey, we budgeted, you know, 200,000 for this rehab. Uh, and then we opened this wall and your budget just went up a hundred thousand as versus you're going to be probably within what, 10 to 20% of what your anticipated budget is on a new build, right? Oh, it should be far less than that. It's, it, it's so mm-hmm. simple. And when people think that new development, new builds are risky, there's either they have no clue what they're talking about, which is oftentimes the, the case, or they have seen people do it in very, it tends to be just the big metros and they are conflating having land that needs uh, rezoned or subdivided or some sort of entitlement change or entitlements brought into it or utility extension. They're conflating that process with the new build because that process can be a huge pain in the butt. The vertical construction is very, very, very simple for just, you know, especially entry level houses. It's just a box with some infrastructure. That's it. If you set up your uh, arrangement with your contractor correctly, if they're properly incentivized and, you know, that's not a concern that they're a crook or anything like that. Um, Really, you know, if you didn't test the soil, that could be a surprise. There could be a a soil problem uh, that varies depending on where you are in the country, but it is incredibly simple. And so the markets that I build in are very intentional in that the process to get a permit for residential construction is incredibly easy, incredibly cheap. I mean, we closed I closed on a couple more lots uh, last week and the week before in Pueblo West, and we should have the permits and break ground on these things this month. Like that, people, it, it, it's it's so simple, and then it's just a little box. You know, uh, my older friend that you know, uh, when I met him and he showed me some of the first houses he was building at the time, he goes, "Dan, building houses like this is child's play," and he is uh, correct. So, oh yeah, well, and and the thing is with you know, new technology, you know, associated with building and, you know, the the idea of, you know, some of the prefab homes that are out there um, beyond the stick build homes, depending on area and depending on the desirability uh, can reduce your building costs even more. And I think, you know, I'm looking at all these homes in Pueblo West that have sold recently. And, you know, I, I know these cabinets, I know you got, I know these cabinets are from Home Depot. I know that fiction, you know, all this stuff, you know, they're, they're Home Depot houses is what I call them. Yeah. That's my house right here is, you know, I bought it from a flipper that did a really bad job, but (laughs) it's, you, you can break down the costs of, you know, all the finishes and you can kind of splurge a little bit to make it really attractive because you are, you know, just because it's an entry level home, it doesn't mean people don't want granite countertops and stainless steel appliances and, you know, or, you know, stainless steel fixtures and, you know, all, all this kind of stuff that does not cost a lot of money where, um, you know, it's, it's just attractive. It's more simple and you're going to have a buyer because people want to live in a new house too. So you can kind of get into the head, you know, headspace of other people of, you know, in certain areas where there hasn't been, you know, a lot of his, you know, history associated with it of, you know, people might not want the new build in, you know, the old North end of Colorado Springs, you know, they want the charm of, you know, the historic residence that's a hundred years old and stuff like that. But if you're looking at a starter home where, you know, it's a young couple where, you know, one's a nurse, one's a policeman, um, give them that three, two with granite countertops and, you know, put a garage in, you know, I think that's a a point that you make on, on your builds, uh, 
um, that's really attractive, especially in places like Colorado, where, you know, you get hail and it's all those little things that are associated with it that are so simple and so cheap uh, to do when you're doing it on the front end, which you can only do when it's a new build. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, long story short, in Colorado, inventory has continued to shrink and it is still uh, pretty busy out here. So do you want to speak to a little more on just affordable housing uh, there, Mason, on your project? Yeah. Yeah. And kind of tying the points I was just making right there of, you know, there's with, with new technology out there, whether it's the alternative building materials or, you know, prefabricated homes, I think there's been a stigma a long time for manufactured housing um, or, you know, any, anything that you might consider prefab. But if you go and look at them, um, they're beautiful and mm -hmm. you can get them at very, very affordable prices. And, you know, that's not just, you know, a manufactured mobile home. I mean, that's barn dominium kits and all these other things. And the, the, the point I'm making there is, you know, whether it's on the new build side or, you know, the buy and hold, for, you know, and, you know, the burr, you know, which, is, which is what I'm doing. Um, the cheaper you can build, the cheaper you can sell, because sometimes it's the idea of the sales cycle um, that is really desirable or the ability to rent, you know, where it is the 1% rule. And especially in Colorado and these mountain towns, affordable housing is one of the biggest issues mm -hmm. that you can have here. Colorado is so expensive to live um, compared to a lot of places, but it's so desirable to live. And I can't tell you how many people I've had, you know, employees in my previous career that moved out to Colorado and just couldn't afford and then moved back home. Mm -hmm. And if there were more opportunities for affordable housing, um, you're, you're, you're never going to have a shortage um, pretty much no matter what community you're in, you know, you think about one of the most expensive markets in the world, you know, or in the U S at least of Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and how it's making national news for affordable housing of if you had gone there and gotten a cheap crappy deal, uh, or not crappy, but a cheap deal, uh, 10 years ago and made it so where it was cheap, affordable housing, I guarantee you that thing would rent forever. And you're mm -hmm. typically going to get some of the other credits that are associated where you're, you know, going with affordable housing. You know, I'm not the type of person to seek out grant money from the government because there's a lot of stipulations associated with it. But my whole project probably could have been covered by, you know, the Colorado Affordable. Um, I think it was like the Community Development Fund uh, that it's, hey, if you rent out to, you know, a certain percentage of AMI annual median income, you know, tenants, dude, we'll fund your whole project. Yeah. Um, or give you I some of the rates they gave, you know, is, uh, you know, 10 or 15 years terms. And, um, 30 year amortization at one to 2% interest. Uh, so, you know, look at the incentives associated with affordable housing and whatever your local community is, there's a lot of free money out there. And if you're fine, you know, kind of working with the government on it, especially if you can combine the strategy that Dan's talking about with the tenant that I'm talking about, I mean, you can cash flow forever. A lot of them are still in the opportunity zones and, you know, there's a lot of opportunity zone, you know, opportunities uh, still available, not as much as there used to be. But um, and you, if you invest in these areas that the government has deemed necessary to invest, it's going to be a great play in the long term. Yeah. Yeah. No, agreed. There's, I, I, if there's one, uh, one simple sentence to summarize what we're seeing still very in demand, it's affordable housing, land, et cetera. If affordable is the point, low end or entry level. So. Exactly. And yeah, if you but, tie the you know, the business that we do, you know, from an active business perspective of purchasing land at a discount, it's an amazing way to vertically integrate into your business, uh, doing ground up development in an affordable way to whether you want to uh, sell it and take what would have been, you know, a buy for 15, sell for 30 lot into a buy for 15, you know, construct for 200, sell for 380. Um, that's a great way to do it. Or, you're able to refinance out of that and have a great rental property that you know was constructed well because you built it yourself and then you get all the tax advantages of it. So it's yep. looking at, you know, multiple disposition strategies that align with the market that you're in, you know, with your risk tolerance. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we wanted to finish off with some uh, deals we're both doing right now that kind of illustrate the point, both good and bad of markets that have really slowed where we maybe messed up and didn't read the writing on the wall and then markets where uh, the numbers ended up being better than expected because there's still a lot of demand. So you want to go first there, Mason? Yeah, I, I think um, like one market that I'll kind of talk about, you know, just because it's consistent with what we've been talking about is Douglas County, Colorado. 
um, which if you're from Colorado or you're familiar with it, it's in between Colorado Springs and Denver. So there, there are jobs there. Um, you know, there, there's a good amount of jobs, both in Castle Rock, as well as Monument, Palmer Lake and stuff like that. But it's not a young community. You know, yeah. young people don't live there. It's very unaffordable. Um, it's extraordinarily expensive. I think the cheapest house that has sold there um, anytime recently is in the six or 700,000 range. Um, and they're all beautiful homes too. They're not cheap, crappy homes or anything like that, where you can go into Boulder, Boulder, Colorado, and, you know, a $700,000 home is a shack, you know, on the yeah. side of the road. So um, it's, it's a unique market. And I think, um, you know, I'd had a lot of luck in it from the acquisition standpoint. And right now the properties are sitting longer than I would like them to. And it goes, sure. it's, it's just the idea of, you know, they're priced appropriately. The listings look great. You know, they're with a realtor that knows the area. Um, but the sales cycle is going to take a little bit longer, which is just kind of one of those things that you have to look at the economy and match it where these lots probably in 2021, I think all of my lots in Douglas County probably would have been off the market at above at or above asking price where going into other small communities where I've got a recent deal that I've done in rifle Colorado that, you know, it's a um, $150,000 acquisition. Uh, we have it on the market for 450,000. Uh, we'll probably do a price reduction a little bit because it's gotten a ton of interest. Um, but it's, it's a bizarre community, which I'll get into kind of from, you know, as I guys standpoint in, this, in, in a second. Uh, but it's the only multifamily lot available in Garfield County, Colorado at all. So it's a very unique property. Um, but there's not a lot of multifamily development that goes on there. Uh, it's, uh, you know, the, the planning, you know, allows for nine, uh, townhomes to be developed. Um, you know, that's adjacent to another townhome community that it's going to be a part of within the HOA. So it's, actually a really simple process. We bought it from the developer of the original townhome community. Um, but the thing is with a product like that, it's very difficult to price on the sales side because it doesn't exist. And even though there's been a lot of interest, people are like, it's just priced a little too high for us right now, despite the fact that, you know, with costs of townhome, you know, building and everything like that, um, you know, the person would make a ton of money whenever they develop it. But the point I'm making there is it's a smaller, it's a very conservative community. You know, mm -hmm. that's where Lauren Boebert is from, you know, and if that, that tells you anything, it's how conservative of a community it is. And in a lot of markets, um, you know, you'll put something on the market for, you know, 150, $160,000 and you'll get buyers come in and make you offers for 90,000. Um, but here they're the type of people where it's, if the property is listed at 390, they'd make an offer th for 385. Um, but if it's listed at 450, they won't make an offer at 390. They find it insulting to do stuff like that is something I'm learning from my local realtor out there. So just kind of bizarre. But um, I think right now for me, I think my biggest frustration in the business is the increased time in the sales cycle that I'm not quite used to, despite the desirability or the, you know, um, you know, uniqueness of the product. Sure, what, sure. What yeah. That, that one will move and that'll be a great deal once it does. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, do a yeah. price reduction by $100,000 and there's still 200 grand in equity in the deal. So, yeah, yeah. No exactly. Complaints. So, yeah, no, I think those illustrate the point well. Um, for me, I uh, I want to make a point with one of the, with the bad one I'm going to use. So 1868 Muriel Street in uh, North Carolina is one I bought. And this is the longest it's ever taken me to sell a lot. I bought this, I think last October. It's under contract to sell this month or early next um, at like, what is it? I, I want to say 19,500. I bought it at 11. I listed it at 35 initially. And so the point I'm making is more along the lines of the whole conversation about understanding the nuances of your market, what is and is not in demand and uh, how to buy the right product. And this is an example where I messed up. I did not buy the right product because I did not understand yet. I was just getting in that market that soils tests are really kind of do or die there. Uh, so let me make a, a contrast here in Pueblo West, Colorado, bought and sold a lot of land, built a bunch of houses. And I have never had a soils test done prior to closing because it's not a dichotomy. Um, on uh, yes, you can build or no, you can't. It just gets a bit more expensive, um, especially if it's a septic tank lot as opposed to a sewer lot. Whereas in Brunswick County, for all intents and purposes, it's yes, you can build or no, you cannot. Um, and I, I guess 
when we started there, I just didn't understand the degree to which that was true. And so this one has not had a soils test. And so it has not sold. And uh, getting a soils test done through that county, it's actually a site evaluation takes 12 to 14, sometimes 16 weeks. So I never did it. Uh, anyway, so this just ended up being a crappy deal. Won't make much. Taking a long time to sell because I didn't really understand uh, the nuances of that market and what sort of asset I should be focusing on. So in hindsight, everything we're buying there is A, either or has, has sewer. So the soils test in that market doesn't really matter. Or uh, B, already has a soils test on file. Even if it's expired, if it has a pass one on file, people are comfortable buying it. Um, so that's just a lesson in knowing, knowing your market and knowing the norms there. For anyone that knows anything about septic tanks and conventional versus engineered systems, yes, you can always put in an engineered system, but in that specific market, the cost to do so would, nobody would do it is the point. It doesn't make sense. So for all intents and purposes, it is a dichotomy of yes, this is, or no, this is not buildable. So that was a, a failure on my part. My part. What's, what's the easiest way to find out all that information kind of on the front end for County a local Health market? Department. Why? I mean, all of the nuances of that individual market. Who who do you talk to? Yes, the so find a realtor who's selling all the land. I, I promise, if you pull up land sales, there's going to be a couple of names that pop up more than everyone else's. Call them, talk through it with them. There we go. There we go. Yeah, and I, I think it's one of those things where you know you you have to be serious because just like with anyone, you don't want to waste anyone's time. You know, if you're going to that realtor and they're giving you a lot of advice for free, um, that would have taken you hours and hours and hours, um, and potentially losing money on deals to figure out, uh, make it worth their time, even pay them for it, you know, honestly. Yep. Um, so you can kind of figure all that out, but, uh, yep. I love it. Um, I think this was a great, uh, great episode kind of talking about where we're, where we're at in the business. Um, you know, what, yeah, what's going on, the strategies associated with the kind of shifts in the market, um, at a higher level. But the biggest thing is, you know, continue. There's always going to be deals to be made out there, no matter what is going on. Yeah. So on the flip side of that, to illustrate the uh, a good deal that makes the points, some of the points I want to make uh, is one I just closed in Miami-Dade County in Florida. Uh, this is in Homestead, Florida, just outside of Miami. Uh, almost no inventory. And keep in mind, everything's relative. Miami's very expensive, very expensive. And so this was over an acre. I want to say 1.3 acres. Everything else available in Homestead, Florida uh, was in the multiple hundreds of thousand range minimum. And then this one we listed at 129 and bought it at 45. It took a long time to get this deal. But point being, we're in one of the most desirable or busiest parts of the country where tons of people are moving, tons of money is going, and there's very little inventory and there's nothing available under 200. So when I put up the quote unquote affordable lot for 129, it was under contract at 13500 within uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, 10,000 non-refundable earnest. And uh, that just closed yesterday after a couple of weeks. And so it's just a great deal because we're in a place where there's tons of demand still, and it was the more affordable product. It's amazing. It's amazing. And, and, and the thing is, you know, any deal like that, I mean, that's a grand slam. And uh, sometimes those happen um, and they're very strategic and they're expected and they're anticipated based on strategy. And sometimes they're lucky. And, uh, you know, the only way to get lucky is by continuously taking action and doing it in really good areas that there is, you know, proof, you know, a proof of concept rather than entire speculation. Um, yep. So great work on that one, man. You owe me dinner or something for. for Thank you. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs> sounds good. But anyways, I think that's everything I wanted to say on the topic. Mason, anything to add? Nope. I think that'll do it for me. Awesome. Well, guys, thanks for joining us on the Big Picture Blueprint, and we'll catch you next time.